such a profound point, David. It, it, it's it's the humility that comes from seeing these longer yes. patterns. Uh, I, a, a number of weeks ago, I was talking to Lauren Myers here in, in Austin, who's been doing this pioneering work, tracing infection rates. Mm -hmm. and, and one of the points she made that I think builds on what you said is, you know, we actually were stockpiling for certain kinds of, of uh, problems, but not we didn't stockpile the right stuff. That's and, right. And, and that's part of the issue, isn't it? Th that, that is right. I mean, if you look back uh, 20 years ago, and it did come out of China, the great fear was a virus called H5N1. H5N1 was the, just about the deadliest virus anyone had ever seen. Um, if you were a bird handler, and you're in a wet market and you cut up, you know, cut the neck of poultry and you got H5N1, you were going to die. The, the mortality was like 70%. No one had ever seen anything like this. And everyone was saying, oh my God, this is the fatal strain. This is the next great pandemic. But what happened with H5N1 is that remarkably, birds could infect bird handlers, but bird handlers could not infect other humans. Wow. In other words, it could the, the virus could not jump the shark. And if it hasn't done it in 20 years, the chances are that it won't. But immediately, you know, we began producing what we thought were all of these um, you know, medicines that might deal with that. And the same with MERS and SARS. It's just, as you mentioned, you need science and you need humility. It's a very good word. That's, that's exactly right. So, so David, one of the things I've become fascinated in, with and interested in that, that I really hadn't thought about, even though I'm supposed to be a historian of this stuff, is the social history of the virus, right? I mean, we are surviving now because we have electronic mm -hmm. communications, we have credit cards, we can drive and do curbside. I don't know what we would do if we couldn't have curbside takeout in our house, right? How would I keep the TV happy yes. here, right? So yes. how did people survive when they went into quarantine in 1918, 1919? What, what was it like? That's, that, that, that's, a, that's a really good question. They did not go into the kind of lockdowns that we went into now. They did close schools, for example. Um, and that, that was, I think, important. But, but you know, as, as you know, Jeremy, in, in places like Austin as well, closing schools has all kinds of problems. And in New York City in 1920, the biggest problem was that's where m most of the kids got fed. Right. Um, so, so, you know, you, you, you really have to think about that. But generally what they tried to do in a city like New York, they couldn't close it down, were to stagger business hours. Um, they realized we're going to do the best we can to social distance. We're going to wear masks. We have no other therapeutic preventions. We cannot possibly, for the reasons you mentioned, we cannot possibly have a total lockdown because we'll starve to death. Um, and, and, and basically, the people who had full-time jobs during this uh, era were um, police, fire, sanitation, one of the things you may know from World War I is that we sent over so many doctors and nurses to Europe that we were caught uh, with an enormous medical shortage when that uh, influenza hit. There simply weren't enough doctors. And, and in one of the readings I gave to, to the teachers, there weren't enough carpenters to make coffins. They were just taking bodies and dumping them into lime pits. Um, but but they're, 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 in, in terms of did people go out, the answer is yes, they did go out much more. They didn't stop the baseball season, for example. Um, it turned out to be the Black Sox scandal. Right. They, probably sh they probably should have stopped the baseball season, but they did not. Um, people went about their business more, but, but also the numbers of people who were getting deathly ill um, was, uh, was staggering. And as, as hopefully we'll talk about when we come back, um, some cities did this better than other cities. And I gave you San Antonio uh, as a city that did not do right. it well. Right. Yeah. 
your point on lockdowns was my uh, Allison, my, my wife was a city council member was was shaking her head saying yes the governor should have allowed us to lock down more we might have done a better job that was her point of view <laughs> just yeah, making, yeah, yeah. putting that out there um i i want to turn to the teachers questions uh sure. and i want to also um just recognize i think ambassador chase untermeyer a good friend and oh, chair sure. of the of texas is on is on the call is on the, the discussion as well we just wanted to uh, acknowledge him and all the work he does for Humanities Texas. Um, the uh, first question from one of the teachers, John Underwood, asks uh, sort of who was mainly responsible for the therapeutic response uh, in 1918, 1919? Federal, local? How did how did those? Very good, very good question. Um, there was virtually no federal response. Uh, the federal government was prosecuting that war. That's all they cared about. And indeed, as I'm sure you know, Jeremy. Um, Woodrow Wilson came down with a fairly serious case of influenza when he went to France, um, just as you know, when the war ended to, to hash out the peace. <clears throat> so the federal government was out of the picture completely. And this is an era, um, the, the teachers um, probably know this, but there was no NIH, there was no CDC, uh, you know, there were no government epidemiologists, uh, there were no real uh, government laboratories, only the ones that were looking for uh, bad whiskey, uh, for example, is, is, is what you might see. Um, the, the lockdowns were mainly done locally. They were done by cities. You, you had some states that became involved, but it basically was individual cities that decided what the lockdown would be. And one of the things that I think the teachers may find interesting, in San Antonio, the city government did not do a really good job. But there are a number of military installations around San Antonio, and there still are, as you know, and they were, they took it much more seriously. They took it much more seriously. Interesting. So on that uh, exact topic, Anthony Galos asks, um, did the influenza hurt the military prosecution of the war? How did it affect military forces? That, Anthony, that is a question that his military historians are going to have to pursue further. Because there is, I won't say strong evidence, but there is evidence from the diaries of German generals that their final offensive in 1917 was badly hindered by influenza. That so many of their troops were sick that they could not mount the kind of offensive that they hoped would knock England and France out of the war before America became involved. So that, that's a damn good question. And the answer is a lot more research has to be done, but we do know from looking at um, diaries and other documents um, from German commanders that it, it, it appeared to have a very serious impact um, on their final offensive. And what occurred to me a, a little while ago, David, I don't know if this is, if this is entirely accurate, but it does seem as if, if American soldiers brought this over to Europe, uh, America's entry into the war might have been most significant for that reason, right? <laughs> it's possible, but I think um, I think the influenza did not simply come over with Americans. Um, it, it was there. Right. It was already there uh, when Americans got there. We certainly added to it, but but influence was pretty much everywhere on the battlefield by that point. Um, so Denise Placencia asks, when and how bad was the third wave? Ah, very good question. The third wave was serious, but not nearly as bad. It was sort of in between the oh. bland first wave and the powerful second wave. You did have a third wave. And the third wave, um, as you see when you'll do from the reading um, that you'll do uh, about San Antonio, the third wave actually hit San Antonio as hard as the second wave did. So it really depended on area to area. Also, Jeremy, as you know, um, a virus can only survive by going from host to host. So the more people who come down with the disease, the fewer places the virus has to go. That's called herd immunity. And herd immunity comes from just people getting sick or people getting vaccinated. And by the third wave, there was a lot of herd immunity out there from the first two. And, um, and just to be just to be clear, because I see this sometimes in, inaccurately reported, herd immunity though requires quite a lot of people. It does. It depends on 
you're absolutely right. It depends on the virus. But if we get, for example, we 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 feel right now that we have maybe 10% herd immunity in the United States maximum. Let's say that 50% of the people decide to take the vaccine and the vaccine is 50% effective. You might not get to herd immunity immediately. It's going to take a while. Right. And herd immunity, I'll also say, um, Jeremy, it depends on the virus. For example, the most transmissible infectious disease ever is measles. Measles is unbelievable. So you need a herd immunity of like 97% for measles to, to, to wipe out measles. Um, polio a little bit less. I don't know what COVID will be. It's, it's in, we don't know yet. It's an interesting question. Mm -hmm. But if we get herd immunity of 50%, I think we'll be in good shape. Gotcha. So uh, Emma Long, uh, <clears throat> another question about schools. What did students do to learn when they weren't in schools? I they didn't do anything. <laughs> there was no uh, virtual learning. Um, the only thing that happened uh, basically was that um, you did have nurses who went around to check on them. Um, the nuns in New York City actually did an amazing job of bringing food and treating the sick. The biggest issue with children, and that, that's why this is such a good question, the biggest issue with children in New York City was that so many of them became orphans. There were tens of thousands of orphans in New York City, their parents were gone. And, and how do you feed them? How do you clothe them? That became a bigger issue than school. Right. Sure, wow, wow. And yeah. Really puts things in perspective. Um, Elizabeth Barnes asks about uh, John Berry's book uh, on the great influenza. And um, she asks about his, ar his uh, argument about cognitive abnormalities that occurred from the, from the uh, influenza. Yeah, the, you know, the, the answer is, um, I, we, the answer is we don't know. Um, John, for example, <clears throat> excuse me, not only talks about cognitive abnormalities, but he is certain that it begins in Fort Haskell, Kansas. Right. Um, there are all kinds of really interesting theories. I know him a bit in John's book. Um, and we, there was absolutely no follow-up. What really happened after the great influenza burned itself out is that people stopped thinking about it. They didn't want to think about it. They didn't want to go back. They began to see it as a once in a millennium type of thing. So the, and be, be, because it took the longest time to get any kind of therapeutic that might help. We didn't get a flu vaccine until well into World War II. So it's very possible there were these cognitive abnormalities. And you can obviously see them when you read the literature, you look at letters, um, you look at hospital admissions and the like, but the answer is the sample is, is really much, much too small uh, to draw any conclusions. Well, and it's th that's such an, a fascinating point, David, the, the ways in which we forgot about this. I mean, yeah. 625,000 Americans die, 50 million worldwide. Uh, but I'll, I'll be honest, until a few years ago, this was, you know, one portion of one lecture in the yep. American History Survey for me, exactly. but I have three lectures on World War I. Exactly. That's exactly. And you know what was interesting, Jeremy? The professor who really brought, did, any, did more to bring this out was Alfred Crosby from the University of Texas. Yes. yes. He, wrote, he wrote the first great book on the great influenza where he said, oh, my God, take a look at this thing. Yeah. So yeah. it happened right here in Austin. I, I was rereading that uh, over the while we were uh, quarantined, and in the preface, he says how hard it was to get a publisher. That's right. No exactly. one was interested. <laughs> no one heard of it. I know it's, it's, it's amazing. It really is amazing. So yeah. David Larkin asks another wonderful question here sure. about religious reactions. Was there a, an apocalyptic reaction from religious leaders? <clears throat> I can only speculate. Um, and, you know, from the reading that I've done? And the answer is yes. Um, anytime there is an apocalyptic event, um, certain ministers tend to see this as a sign from God. Um, with smallpox, it was a sign that um, God, God's wrath was coming down on parts of the flock who had moved away. Um, as late, Jeremy, as you know, uh, as HIV, 
Um, you had parts of the Jerry Falwell, the religious right, who believed that um, this was God's way of punishing Sodom and Gomorrah. I mean, who were the people who were most at risk? Gay men and intravenous drug users. So what you, what you have are ministers who, who basically come down and say, you see, if we do not behave, if we do not follow the scriptures, this is what follows. And that, the reason that is such an interesting question is that occurs in every epidemic of which I am aware. Wow, wow. And, and what about the other side of that, David? Those who deny, those who say somehow I'm immune because you know, God is on my side. <laughs> We're, we're getting on to political ground here. No, I'm not mentioning anyone, any particular name. <laughs> I'm just, you know, there are um, people who think it doesn't yeah, affect um, uh, I Yeah, I think, um, I think that during the great influenza, there was almost no one I, who denied what was in front of his or her eyes, mm -hmm. their eyes. No, no one denied it. I think there were those who said, let's cast it to the side because the military effort is so much more important. That is primary. And that is what we have to focus on. But I can't think of anyone who was actually at that point saying there is no virus out here. It was it was simply too obvious. Gotcha. A couple we have a couple more questions sure. and we get to that. There's terrific questions from the teachers. Really fantastic. Jack they are. Jacqueline Jernigan asks about if those uh, who lived through the swine flu in 2008 uh, were they actually, if they, if they had also lived through the Spanish flu, were they, did they have uh, immunity from one to the other? I would say the answer is no, they did not. Um, uh, I, you know, I haven't really seriously looked at the literature, but one way of answering this question, Jeremy, is that the belief in terms of the 1918 influenza is that the elderly were in a more protected category because there probably had been something 30 years before that was remotely like the 1918 influenza. And therefore there was some immune memory in 1918 if you were over 60 years of age, that is a possibility. But um, I, that fortunately the swine flu turned out to be not a big deal. We thought it was going to be a big deal. It turned out not to be a big deal. So um, I, as far as I know, that there is no correlation between being immune in 2009 from what you had in, in 1918. You know, the one thing you have to know is few, flu mutates right. so dramatically. That's the reason we, I mean, if we had a single flu vaccine, a universal flu vaccine, which we will have someday. Some of us may live long enough to see that. What a benefit to humankind. Can you imagine what a, uni a universal flu vaccine would be like? It'd be like the polio vaccine, right? That's right. It would be, that's exactly what it'd be like. Very good, very good analogy, yeah. So our final question is from Christina Long Longofono. And she asks about masks. Uh, you know, were there similar issues in 1918, 1919 about the appropriate masks, people not wanting to wear masks? The, how can you compare that debate today with the debate in the earlier period? I think the way you can compare it is that um, <clears throat> most people who got influenza in 1918 did not get a mild case of it. They weren't in apparent carriers. They got, they were damn sick. So the message out there was that you better protect yourself any way you can. Um, you did have police in New York City and other, other places who actually gave out tickets for people not wearing masks mm -hmm. um, and for spitting on the sidewalk. Spitting was incredibly common in 1918. I mean, if you think of the average baseball team, before COVID, you know, yes. uh, that, that, was, that was the United States of America in 1918. Um, so masks were seen much more as a real protection. And I don't think, I, as far as I can tell, there was not a whole lot of macho arrogance mm 
about not wearing a mask. I mean, they, they there were so few other protections that, that a, ma a mask was seen as quite valuable.